Good morning, my name is Eveke Smit. I work for the STM Association. We're a member association, so most of the academic publishers worldwide are a member. Our members uh, do roughly, it's sort of 70% of everything that's published scholarly. So in that sense, we see ourselves as a global representative of the scholarly communication community. We represent our members, we try to influence them, inform them, we deliver all kinds of services uh, and in that way we try to support our members, the interests of our members, the industry uh, in general. We work with a lot of other associations on an international level and at the same time more specialised towards scientific, technical and medical publishers. So we try to see ourselves as the global voice of this sector. There's a lot of lobbying, there's a lot of copyright advocacy. Uh, public relations, education and training. My own portfolio is standards and technology and also uh, industry collaboration. What we have been doing now systematically for around 10 years or so, we make annually a forecast of which of the technology trends will impact our industry. I'll be showing you the edition of 2018, which looks ahead to 2022, so we call it Tech Trends 2022. And as you can see, the theme is entering the AI era. It's all about artificial intelligence, uh, but it's not just about the machine. It is especially about how the machine can work with creative humans to reach a higher level in science, in research and in scholarly communication. We created this uh, at a meeting in uh, December 2017. Every year in December, in the dark days, we come together with a big group. We gather usually around 30 people from different publishing companies. We ask them to bring their own top three trends that they think will impact our industry the most in the next three to five years. And we brainstorm using the Delphi method. Here you can see who were there and which organizations they come from. And uh, then we have a smaller group who takes the uh, results of the discussion and processes them a bit further, digests them into what can be sent to the designer uh, for a picture. So this is the process that we use. And let's now go to the outcome of this year. Artificial intelligence is really at the core of the predictions and uh, that's why we thought that the metaphor of a head with a brain would be interesting. Everything inside the head is very focused on AI in combination with publishing and then outside the head you will find all the developments that people identified uh, in our sort of direct environment and all the challenges and opportunities to which publishers should try to find solutions. We try to sort of roughly reflect where certain things are located in the brain and there's here in the very center, this is where uh, specialists tell me in the real brain is the hippocampus and the hippocampus controls long-term memory and emotions. And that is where we placed deep publishing knowledge. And we put it here very much at the central of the brain because it's sort of the source from where the ideas should spark of everything that can be done <coughs> by AI. Another important element in the brain is here the, the, the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe here is dedicated to human AI collaboration. It is typically something that should enable us to improve processes. So AI could replace mundane jobs, but it can also place humans in new places. The green bit, where we usually have uh, mathematical processing, calculations, things like that, uh, is where we put data analytics. There's a lot about the algorithms. Algorithms can be used for unstructured stuff. At the same time, algorithms can turn too much into a black box business models for data analytics, large accountability and trust issue in algorithms, intelligent machine reading, this is all about text and data mining. Text and data mining is particularly popular in 
pharmaceutical research. It accelerates disease treatment. You can make your research design completely AI-based. Uh, you can have meta-prediction. You, you can see AI as sort of a big prediction machine. So this is sort of the top bit of the brain about pure AI. And then here you see a layer where AI gets applied in publishing. Smart services, this is where the lateral lobes come in. Hearing, the senses, vision, things like that. A lot of it is centered around personalization, which of course means user tracking. It's about new metrics, uh, AI for peer review, machine written articles, smart contracts, performance assessments, metrics, uh, intelligent augmentation, user oriented publishing. It is all about individualized precision information. It's about targeted discovery and of course it could accelerate research enormously. We come to the area of research integrity and we put it in the back side of the brain where for example your balance is located. Can AI help to find the flaws in science? It has to do with research data availability. All research outputs available, so not just the research data but all the protocols, the software, metrics assessments, data management plans, open science, detect fraud and error. Then we come to the reptile part of the brain where uh, reflexes are based and that is where we placed the risk and the danger of tech taking over. There's a lot of internet surveillance Technology is not per se benign if it's in the wrong hands. And there's also the question, can we then again use AI to check AI? So tech can help, tech can do harm, and it needs governance. We've explained the inside of the brain. Let's now look at all the things that we face around us and uh, to which our industry needs to find an answer. First of all, we put it on purpose in the front side of the head. Social media with the cyber influencing, can even science get into the grip of social media, how to avoid fake science, what role can publishers take. Easy access, within STM we've started some very big projects to work on single sign-on. It's a complex thing because ID management is not uh, easy. Uh, we lack the simple business models behind it, but we have a big project called resource access in the 21st century. Then sharing platforms, some people said, is it time for a Spotify in science? Somebody else said, you have to find the Napster moment, you know, when is the moment there that all the big parties are really willing to give up a competitive edge? Then there's governance issues uh, and whatever effort we put in, would Google or Sahib still sort of wash it all away? Um, will it all be open? Uh, we had chorus in the US. Trust has really become an issue in the world of fake news and cyber influencing and things like that. Uh, can publishers help avoid crap science? What kind of things can we do in quality assurance? Also think of AI tools that could be used. Research data, also very much trust related. Funders and policy makers are pushing for it, but do they realize what kind of volume we're talking about and what kind of infrastructure will be put in place for it? Will it bust the pipes? Who will handle it? Who will manage it? What will funders pay for? As fair data, fair stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. What do you need to do to, to make that possible? Persistent IDs, very important, data management plans, etc. etc. Then, no picture nowadays without blockchain. I would personally say that the jury is still out on blockchain. Of course, open science is there. It's about sharing, including all artifacts. There, there's a thought bubble about metrics, about GDPR. What was interesting in the discussion in December, which was of course roughly half a year before GDPR was introduced, the especially technology people were pretty pessimistic about the GDPR. I think we're a bit more realistic now and also finding out that GDPR doesn't change all that much. A little bit like Y2K for those who can uh, remember. A few th 
smaller thought bubbles because they're not completely technology related but they may have an important impact. Brexit is there. The UK is a big country in terms of research. It is also a country where most of the scholarly publishers are based. A similar thought bubble on research in Asia. Of course, Asia is growing hugely. It's a small bubble, but it can mean uh, a lot. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.